Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, where we're still in our series in the book of Acts. And Luke breaks from his reporting and writing structure of showing examples of Acts 2, 42 through 47. If you remember, he was given little vignettes, so to say, little illustrations of that chunk of scripture. And he breaks from that usual um, structure to now focus on key figures, uh, showing personal examples of the spirit at work in people. And he shows people that are not the... Uh, uh, necessarily the most popular ones right away. They are converts of the ministry of the church. So we're going to read for the next few weeks uh, examples of what God's doing through converts of those who are getting saved. Isn't that cool? So like we've been learning about Peter and John, the apostles. What about the people that they are reaching and, be, and believing in Jesus Christ? What is the Holy Spirit doing in them? That's what we're going to read about. And today we're going to get into Stephen who is a key figure. His story is brief. You know why? His life is brief. And we're going to see that as well. We are going to cover a lot of scripture. I hope you're ready. If you were here for Hebrews 11, when I did the By Faith series, you may recall we read the entire chapter. We're going to read a longer chapter today. So, and uh, you can check it off your Bible reading plan that you did that. And uh, of course, you might want to read it again, but we're going to begin though, so we're going to be in Acts 6, at the end of Acts 6, verse 8, and then we're going to go all the way to the end of 7. So I hope you're ready, okay? Um, let me start with Acts 6, 8 through 15, and then I'll stop and share with you what, what Stephen says in chapter 7, uh, an overview of what he says. So Acts chapter 6, verse 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace, and power performed many amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves or freed men, these are, these are people who were once slaves to Rome and they were set free. This includes the Sanhedrin as well, so the Supreme Court of the Jewish leaders, started to debate with Stephen. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cis, uh, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they had a difficult time reasoning and, and having the theological debate with Stephen. They were having a hard time because the Holy Spirit was giving him the power to do this. And verse 11 says, so they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and the teachers of the religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Interesting, isn't it? That reminds me of the time where Moses came down the mountain and his face was radiating so much that they put a veil over his face like he had been in the presence of God, because he was. And so possibly it's speaking of that, that Stephen has been in the presence of the Lord, so to say. He, is, he has been in unity. The Holy Spirit is in him. And so he's reflecting and radiating the presence of the Lord as he speaks. He has a face of an angel. It's a supernatural experience that they're seeing. So they resolve to false witnessing. They resolve to hire a few people to lie about what Stephen was saying. And we're not really sure exactly what was said, but they deduct from the next portion of scripture in chapter seven, what he may have been arguing and why they're going back and forth and debating. And let me read to you what uh, the commentary say, because I think it'd be best if I read it for you. The dispute between Stephen and the Greek-speaking Jews focuses on his interpretation of the law of Moses and of God's purpose for temple worship. 
As the bearer of the law, Moses represents God's revelation given to the Jews at Mount Sinai. He symbolized all that was holy and valued in rabbinic religion. So to deny Moses was to assault the divine authority and validity of the worship and practice of the Jews. Stephen is thus accused of changing the customs handed down by Moses. So he's, they're taking his words and they're twisting it as if to say he doesn't admire Moses or the law or the temple worship. They're taking that and they're trying to say he doesn't honor that, he's against it. And that's not what Stephen was saying at all. Stephen was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So secondly, temple worship prescribed the divine order of worship for the people of Israel. To question temple order was seen as a violation of God's power and majesty. Let me go a little further. What Stephen taught did align with the Old Testament prophecy that God does not dwell in temples made by hands. The eternal and spiritual substance of the Old Testament is preserved in the gospel, but Stephen sees the saving work of Christ as bringing to an end the temple order with its ceremonial, ceremonial and sacrificial worship. A new dimension of fellowship with God has been introduced through Jesus. Such fellowship with God far exceeds the temple and its worship. In other words, the old temple is being replaced by a new temple, which is the Christian church. But the Greek-speaking Jews, zealous defenders of tradition, see his prophetic preaching as a threat to sacrificial worship and ceremonial law. In a nutshell, Stephen's preaching that through Jesus, the law has been fulfilled, sacrificial systems are done, and they didn't like it. That Jesus was the last sacrifice for all of our sins. There's no need to, to do uh, physical sacrifices anymore. And they took that to say, you are demeaning the law, Moses, the temple order, the sacrifices, you're bad. Okay, so that is the, the bottom line of what's being said here. Now, we're going to read through Acts 7, 1 through 60, and I'll teach as needed. But what's the overall defense Stephen gives in his history lesson? He is about to give an incredible history lesson here. Number one, his history lesson reveals how the Israelites rejected God's plan and the people he sent to serve as deliverers. We're going to see that. And number two, History reveals how the Israelites limited and tethered their worship of God to a physical temple, okay? Stephen shows them how God is transcendent. God worked outside of sacred land and buildings to accomplish his purposes for his people. God himself was the prize, but they made the temple their prized possession. For instance, today, if you only worship God here, but did not worship him outside of this building. If you, if you had a zeal for this building and that only God can meet you here more than out there, wherever you are, God can be there too. So if we practice that today, we're much like Stephen's enemies here and these Jewish leaders and the freedmen here and the people who are zealously protecting the temple and the sacrificial systems. Why would they do that? Because they don't believe in Jesus. It's simple as that. They haven't accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. Okay. So let's go to verse one of chapter seven. Remember his face is shining like an angel, so to say. He, he appears to look like an angel. So the presence of the Lord is upon him. He's speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. And are you, are you ready? Everyone buckled in. Because my assistant, I think, has 10 slides for our scripture, okay? And big slides too, not the small ones. So here we go. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Notice his respect, by the way. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to this land where you now live. Notice the land, the focus on the land. But God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land. God did promise, however, that, he, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants 
even though he had no children yet. God also told him that his descendants would live in a foreign land where they would be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, God said, and in the end, they will come out and worship me here in this place. God also gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision at that time. So when Abraham became, became the father of Isaac, he circumcised him on the eighth day. And the practice was continued when Isaac became the father of Jacob and when Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs of the Israelite nation. These patriarchs were jealous of their brother Joseph and they sold him to be a slave in Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. And God gave him favor before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God also gave Joseph unusual wisdom so that Pharaoh appointed him governor over all of Egypt and put him in charge of the palace. So notice the rejection of God, rejecting Joseph, and yet God is still faithful. Remember we saying he's a faithful friend? We're gonna see in this scripture again, the, the faithfulness of God, but yet his people rejecting his plans and his people that he has sent for delivery, for, to deliver them. But here's the thing, God continues to be faithful to his promise, even though they've rejected him, rejected his own servant, Joseph. So verse 11, but a famine came upon Egypt and Canaan. There was great misery and our ancestors ran out of food. Jacob heard that there was still grain in Egypt. So he sent his sons, our ancestors to buy some. The second time they went, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers and they were introduced to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent for his father, Jacob, and all his relatives to come to Egypt, 75 persons in all. So Jacob went to Egypt. He died there as did our ancestors. Their bodies were taken to Shechem and buried in the tomb Abraham had bought for a certain price for Hamer's sons in Shechem. As the time, or you could say Shechem, as the time drew near when God will fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. But then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king exploited our people and oppressed them, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. Man, he knows his history, doesn't he? At that time, Moses was born, a beautiful child in God's eyes. His parents cared for him at home for three months. When they had to abandon him, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him as her own son. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was powerful in both speech and action. One day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. So Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day he visited them again and saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, you are brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Who made you ruler and judge over us? He asked, are you gonna kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard that he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There, his two sons were born. 40 years later in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. As he went to take a closer look, the voice of the Lord called out to him, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with terror and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and I've come down to rescue them. Now go for I am sending you back to Egypt. So God sent back the, the same man his people had previously rejected when they demanded who made you ruler and judge over us. Through the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush, God sent Moses to be their ruler and savior. And by means of many wonders and miraculous signs, he led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses himself told the people of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Who do you think he's talking about? Jesus. Moses was with our ancestors, the assembly of God's people in the wilderness, when the angel spoke to him in Mount Sinai. And there Moses received life-giving words to pass on to us. You ready for this? Here's the rejection again. But our ancestors refused to listen to Moses. They rejected him and wanted to return to Egypt. They wanted to return back to slavery. And they told Aaron, make us some gods who can lead us for we don't know what has become of this Moses who brought us out of Egypt because he was gone on, the, on Mount Sinai with God for many days. 
And just like that, within 40 days, they turned their backs on God. After over 400 years in slavery, it took them 40 days to wanna go back into that. So they rejected God's plans and they even wanted Aaron, the priest at the time, to, or gonna be the future priest, but Moses' his helper, they wanted him to create false gods so they could worship them instead or go back to Egypt. Wow. And here God delivers them and that's how they treat him. By the way, if you don't know the story of the Bible, you're getting it right now, aren't you? This is a history lesson of the, of the Old Testament. It's great. So they told Aaron, make us some gods who can lead us for we don't know what has become of this Moses who brought us out of Egypt. Verse 41 so they made an idol shaped like a calf and they sacrificed to it and celebrate over this thing they had made. Then God turned away from them and abandoned them to serve the stars of heaven as their gods. In the book of the prophets, it is written, was it to me you were bringing sacrifices and offerings during those 40 years in the wilderness, Israel? No, you carried your pagan gods, the shrine of Melech. By the way, Melech was a god that they sacrificed humans to, children particularly the star of your God, Raphon, and the images you made to worship them. So I will send you into exile as far away as Babylon. So it's a forward, this is fast forwarding quite a bit in their journey in the 40 years. So this wasn't the first 40 days. Now he's jumped 40 years into it and how they behaved. Our ancestors carried the tabernacle with them through the wilderness. It was constructed according to the plan God had shown to Moses. Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nation that God drove out this land, the tabernacle was taken with them into their new territory and it stayed there until the time of King David. So the tabernacle is where God would meet with them and where they would do the sacrificial practices outside the tabernacle in the courtyard. And so this was the place where they would meet with God. Okay, so now we're starting to get into no longer the rejection of God, but now how the tabernacle was even mobile and God wasn't tied down to a building structure and God does not fit into man-made structures. He's an unlimited God, don't contain him. So now he's moving into that point of his, of his teaching. Verse 46, David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. However, the most high doesn't live in temples made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne. This is powerful. And the earth is my footstool. Can you picture that for a moment? Have you seen a footstool recently? <laughs> Just imagine God's foot on top of the earth, you know? Could you build me a temple as good as that? Asked the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? You stubborn people. Now, <laughs> this is where Stephen... He started off really respectful. And, and now, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's, he's getting real with them. You are a heathen at heart or an uncircumcised Jew might be in your translation. The NLT just translates it for you, what it would have meant back then. It's like he's saying, you're a heathen. You're a Gentile heathen. You stubborn people, you are a heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Ooh, that's a tough, tough word there. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. Ooh. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. Now he brings the rejection into modern day times where they rejected the other servant that was meant to bring complete deliverance from sin, Jesus Christ. You deliberately disobey God, verse 53, deliberately disobey God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fist at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. So there's this chaos going on in this room. And by the way, it's the same room that Jesus was sentenced to death. And he's standing there and 
they are really just becoming irate and angry. And there's this peace over Stephen and he looks up and he says something that's gonna make things worse for him. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now this is very unique. Jesus in scripture is usually being said, he's sitting at the right hand of God. This is the one time in scripture where we see where Jesus stands up. Because he said, if you acknowledge me here on earth, I will acknowledge you before my father in heaven. And Jesus, is a, is, he knows what's about to happen to Stephen. And he stands up to acknowledge Stephen before God because he was willing by himself to make a stand for the truth in front of all these men that were ready to kill him. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened. This is verse 56. And the son of man, the last time the word son of man was ever used in the New Testament, by the way, the same words Jesus used of himself, that these leaders did not like that. They did not like when Jesus said that because it meant the son of God or the Messiah. I see the son of man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting and they rushed at him. There's that rejection. There's that stubbornness of not refusing to listen to the truth, refusing to listen to God's loving rebuke here from one of his servants. Remember, he's saying, you've rejected all of God's servants so far, even Jesus. Guess what? Now they're rejecting Stephen, one of God's servants for telling the truth. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city because that was the law at that time. If you're gonna stone someone, you drag them outside the city and begin to stone him. I won't get into the details of what stoning was back then, but obviously it was deadly. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul, which we later find out is Paul. And we're gonna read about him in a few weeks. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died or fell asleep, your version may say. Wow. And just like that, he's dead. We, we learn about who he is for a moment, a man full of faith, full of power. We don't have details of all the miraculous signs he's done. Luke didn't give us that. That wasn't the focus. He became the first martyr of the Christian church. And the way he went out is the same way Jesus went out. Now, Jesus said, I give you my spirit, Father. Stephen says to, the, to Jesus, I give you my spirit. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And Luke has the same posture and attitude. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Wow, what a beautiful story, isn't it? It was worth the long read. The history lesson there. And I'll just tell you, before I get into the practical application for us and takeaways, I'll just say this. That in the midst of mankind's rejection of God, he remains faithful to fulfill his promises. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. And it's true, because of the gospel, because the veil has been torn, okay, God's presence never did only reside in the temple. He never only resided in the tabernacle. God can go anywhere. Just keep in mind that God went to to Abraham in the land of Ur, not in Jerusalem. So God called Abraham out of Ur, a Chaldean land in the Mesopotamia territory, called him out of there. So that's what Stephen was trying to say is, you guys have limited God to a place or a building, a holy land. You've limited him to to laws. You've limited him to a a temple. And God is bigger than that. And when he sent his messengers, you couldn't see him because you had fell in love or had worshiped these physical things instead of having faith and worshiping the spiritual God, God himself. And so this is his confrontation. 
and he dies worthily before God. Think about that for a moment. False witnessing. They hired people to be a false testimony about Stephen. So what does Jesus do? He stands up and says, I'm a witness. He's telling the truth. Wow. Hey, can I just encourage you with something? Don't be a false witness of someone. Don't do that. Don't, don't allow people to be false witnesses of people either. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't take it hook, line, or sinker. Do not be a false witness or testimony of other people. If someone's gossiping to you, that's a sign right there of their character, that they're talking about someone else without someone being in the room. See, Stephen, it was, Stephen was in trouble no matter what because they hire people to basically lie and twist his testimony. That's what they did. And you know what? I thought about that. I was like, Lord, help us not to be like that either. But more importantly, help us not to be like that about Jesus. So the first takeaway, and this is important, number one, know the truth so you can stand for the truth. Let's not be false witnesses of the truth. Let's not get it wrong. I'm not saying you're perfect. Hey, look, I've made mistakes too about the, the scriptures and the message of the Bible. I've had to correct myself um, because I didn't take in consideration some other perspectives or other teachings in the Bible, other verses, but we need to know the truth so that we can do our best to represent the truth. And if we, if we get it wrong, then we should admit that, right? We should humbly, you know, say, hey, you know, I forgot about this scripture. Or I forgot, you know, okay, I forgot about that teaching. Um, or I didn't know that yet. I'm learning that. But Stephen knew the word, didn't he? Now, did, did the Holy Spirit supernaturally give him everything to say? I don't think so. But did he operate in the gift of wisdom? Yes, every commentator is basically saying he's operating in the gift of wisdom, a word of wisdom from the Lord. So what's happening here is, it's not a word of knowledge where God gave him knowledge about all that stuff. What it is, is he knew the word and God gave him the wisdom, the ability to tie it all together to preach this message. And so here we see the, uh, the gifts of the spirit in action through, through a person. And God wants to give you those gifts as well to help you testify and minister to those around you. But I would say this, this scripture and this, the, his history lesson makes me wanna also know the word of God as best as I can, amen? amen. I wanna encourage you to remember that you're not just reading the Bible because you're supposed to read the Bible or something or to check off a reading plan. But what if, what if God puts you in a place where he takes everything you've read and he helps you witness to someone? Because his Holy Spirit gives you that gifting of wisdom to tie it all together. That's what's gonna happen, I promise you that. If you're out there trying to help people follow Jesus, he's going to work through his spirit. So know the truth so you can properly stand for the truth. Number two, this scripture teaches us to be open and remain open and remain receptive to the truth. So if today, if you have, have, if you have a hard heart towards God, you know, maybe you're not a believer in him yet. Maybe you're in this room or you're online watching right now and you've been, your heart is hardened towards him. Be careful that you do not harden any longer and that you begin to go to God with the hard questions that you have. Be open to the truth. You know what happens a lot of times? We don't want God's way. We want our way. <clears throat> and that's really the, the big issue is we've already cemented our stance on what we want and we're hoping God will fit in with that. And that's what they did. They cemented themselves in tradition. And when Jesus came along on the scene, he didn't fit in their tradition. Are you following me? Jesus referred to that as the old wineskin with the new wine. That you can't put new wine in an old wineskin because if you do, the fermentation will make the wineskin bust and it can't contain or hold the new wine. Jesus was saying, in order for you to follow my kingdom, in order for you to truly believe in what I'm saying, you have to have new faith. You have to have a new life. You have to have a new wineskin. You gotta, you gotta 
put, put to death the old traditions and receive and be open to the new, what I'm teaching, okay? And it wasn't wrong, it was God's plan. It wasn't like a, a, a false teaching, it was Jesus, it was God, it was the Holy Spirit all in one. It was the message of God. But these men in the synagogue, they could not receive it. They could not receive the new revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's be careful that we don't let our hardened hearts or our traditions stop us from understanding who Jesus is and following his way, amen? Let us follow his way. Number three, we need to be willing to be rejected with the truth. Notice I say with the truth. We need to be willing to be rejected with the truth. Not everyone's gonna like the truth. The way Stephen handled this was beautiful. He handled it with grace. He started off with respect. Did he, did he boldly confront them? He did. But it was the truth. And the, the Holy Spirit was given to him the tact to express the truth. But even then, people are not going to accept truth. Now, we don't live in a society currently where we are all under threat like this. Now, remember too, these were people who believed in God who killed Stephen. Isn't that interesting? It wasn't the Romans, it wasn't the Greeks. They actually didn't have permission to stone Stephen. Rome had to give them permission to do this. So they actually, this is how you know they were really being deceiving. They hired false witnesses and then they didn't even seek the council or the, the governor of Rome in this location. And so they were acting out of their traditions of keeping and containing it. And they were saying, basically, we're against Jesus and his followers, okay? But these were people who believed in God, just did not believe in Jesus, all right? We don't live in a society where we are under life or death threat every day for going out and telling the truth like this. Do you follow me on that? I know that that could be the reality one day in America. Isn't that crazy? It, it is the reality in other places. It is the reality in certain countries right now, like North Korea, like China, some places in India, some places in Africa. That is the reality. Pakistan, Iran, you could be killed, beheaded or something for your stand of the truth. Now, I do realize that there, are, there is violence coming to houses of worship in America, isn't there? And thank God for our security team. And they, they're looking after us. And by the way, we are working hard on that, yes. <clears throat> Just wanna let you know that before what happened at Joel Osteen's church, we actually had a meeting plan to make sure we're securing our grounds better and doing a better job. And that we're also hiring uh, a specialist and a professional in this field to give us good plans to make sure we're staying sharp on our protection of our facility. Because we wanna be good stewards of our protecting everyone here. So we do realize that that could happen, okay? Uh, but the reality is we're not gonna face this kind of pushback or death if we share with our neighbors, our friends, the truth, right? You see what I'm saying? That's the extreme case. And so I just wanna let you know, like do not let the potential pushback stop you from sharing the truth in love. And honestly, a lot of people just need to hear the truth. And it doesn't have to be in a harsh way at all. It's just the truth that Jesus came to save us from our sin. And he offers eternal life and freedom from the chains of sin when we put our faith in Christ and trust him and receive life in him. That, that doesn't sound very hostile, does it? <laughs> that doesn't sound mean at all. That sounds like something to share with our friends and neighbors. Uh, fourth, be like Jesus if you suffer for the truth. Be like Jesus 
if you do suffer for the truth, even if it's something as, you know, your parents or your family want nothing to do with you now. What do I mean by that? Stephen did not retaliate, did he? Did he pick up a stone? Oh yeah. (laughs) I think he's gonna lose that fight. He didn't do that. Instead, he gave his life to God. He surrendered his spirit to God. And then he said, Father, forgive them. In other words, his, his way of suffering, just like Jesus, it actually proves the genuine message. It proves the truth of the message. And so when we are being mistreated by someone inside the church or outside the church, what does your life reflect? Does your character actually come out as Christ-like or do you actually do something that's not Christ-like and now you diminish your testimony? Are you following me on that? That we must be careful that if we are going to be persecuted, even inside the church or we're being lied about or whatever it may be, how you handle that is so important because it can actually testify of the truth. It can be a testimony for you and most of all for Jesus Christ. And lastly, be a living sacrifice for the truth. You see, I don't think we're all gonna be stoned today when we leave for our faith. But what we can be is a living sacrifice for the truth. What do I mean by that? Let me show you the scripture, Romans 12. We all know this very well. Romans 12, one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We are the tabernacle. We are the temple of God, amen? Amen. And we are meant to be tabernacles or temples that reveal God and we're not dead, we're alive. So we get to be a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing. So if anything, if anything, be dead to sin, put to death your sinful ways. In other words, be, don't respond to those things. Don't respond to self gratification and selfish ambition. Be dead to self, deny yourselves like Jesus says, Take up your cross and follow me. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. It means to deny yourselves, be willing to suffer for Christ and follow him. Take up your cross, suffer with him and follow him. So that means you're alive. Now, you know what they did? When he said that, they knew what sacrifices were on the cross or they knew what crucifixions were on the cross. They understood that because Rome did this often. So they knew when Jesus said, deny yourself and take up a cross, he was saying, be willing to die for me as you follow me. But you're alive, so you're a living sacrifice. And when you are alive, make sure your sacrifice is holy and pleasing to me. Why? Because God would use you to draw people into the light from the darkness. You would be a a light on a hill. Amen? Let's be a living sacrifice that draws people to the love and light of God, the truth. Why don't we stand together? Let me encourage you with this last thing. I'm encouraged by this. Jesus stands with us when we take a stand for the truth. You don't stand alone when you're standing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this particular story, it was the gospel. Maybe you've had to stand, make a stand for the truth and it's not necessarily about the gospel, it's something else. If you are being truthful and honest and holy in that stand, then Jesus will stand with you. And he will defend you and you don't have to defend yourself. And you can let God defend you, okay? And how you stand 
in grace and compassion is so important. But today, if you have not realized the faithfulness of God, if you've been rejecting him, please stop. God loves you. He has put up with our stubborn ways so long and he's not gonna stop. He's going to continue, but he will stop eventually one day. Right now is the season of grace, so to say, the day of grace. As the Bible says in Hebrews, it's a time of grace where he is being gracious and, and you may be rejecting him now, but one day there will no longer be rejection or acceptance because it will be what it is, heaven or hell. You won't be able to reject him anymore because you will be sentenced. You'll be judged to where you belong forever. But if, if, if now you open your heart and no longer reject him, and if you will not want it to be your way and choose the way of Christ, like be open to the way of Jesus, okay? I know it can be scary. Let me, let me hone in on this for a moment. I think a lot of us have gripped onto the world so much and what we want that we could be actually missing Jesus. Even in the church, we can grip onto churchy things and be missing Jesus in our life. You could, be say, you could be saved. I'm not saying you're not, but I'm saying like you could be missing out on an experience with Jesus. And I just wanna ask you to surrender and let go of that and be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit. Do not reject the Holy Spirit pulling you. So if you need prayer for anything, like giving your life to Christ, if you need prayer because you've been rejecting God's way and you know God's been telling you to do this, you know that God's been speaking to you and ministering to you to, to let go of something and to receive him or grab a hold of him. We want to pray for you. And so I'm going to have the prayer team stay here afterwards when we close to pray. So why don't you, prayer team, why don't you come on up and pastors will come on up and we're going to be ready for you. But we want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. He loves you. His love is relentless. He's going to keep coming after you. How many, how many can testify to that? Amen. I say surrender. Surrender to his love and let him teach you a new way of living. Cling on to tr Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for this word today. Thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of our rejection for millennia. We have rejected you, God, but you have remained faithful. Lord, forgive us for that. Lord, forgive us for thinking we know best and we know the right way. We don't. The only way is through Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for sending him to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for us, to be the sacrifice for all of our sins, to give us life eternal. I pray, Lord, that we would open our hearts to receive this truth today for the first time or to recommit ourselves and Lord, if we've even been rejecting you or we've been doing uh, Christianity our way and not the way of Christ, Lord, as, as, as your followers, Lord, I pray that we would get back on track with you and follow your way. Help us, Lord. Lord, we, won't, we don't wanna reject your spirit as they were. And we don't wanna re reject your servants either that you're using in our lives to speak into our lives. God, I pray that we would humble ourselves and and. And take note that, God, you're sending people in our path to speak to us truth because you love us. You're sending deliverers. You're sending people to speak truth because you love us. And you don't want us going down that path. So I pray, God, that we would be receptive to your servants that you are sending or using, even if it's this message today. Help us to be receptive, Lord, and to not harden our hearts. Thank you once again for being a faithful friend. We love you, God. And I'm so grateful for this church. Thank you, God, for a church who can sit through a long reading of scripture, who wants scripture, who wants the truth, who wants to stand up for the truth, who wants to be living sacrifices for the truth. Thank you for a church like that. God, continue to help us. We know that you stand with us. We love you. We give you glory and praise for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise.
We thank you, Lord.